All right. Um, so maybe what a good thing to do is to kind of, for those, does everyone, who's a Java programmer? You're a Java? Okay, very large percentage. Uh, and Python? Just a few, okay. Now the, the nice thing about um, Java, it's very easy to read because it's very long sentences, right? right? And Python is nice. Yeah. <laughs> so well, what's Python. your opinion on this? What's your favorite language, are you? I, pro I program in both. I'm, I call myself, I consider myself a polyglot programmer, so okay. many languages. I like them both. Okay. I, I'm starting to warm up I'm to Python. I'm non-committal. So uh, actually when I was uh, uh, working on some of the slides for some of these talks, when I try to do them in Java, they don't fit on the slide. Uh. I was showing uh, cross-group transactions and I had a uh, Java slide and a Python slide. The Python slide was first, it was great. When I put the Java slide, people were, you know, yeah. and hawing. So. Yeah. Okay, so let's imagine you wanted to get started with, um, we'll, we'll do Java. Just. Well, I was going to say maybe right before we jump into yeah. it, if there are any general questions. Okay. Uh, because then if people, you know, have to go for whatever reason, you know, they can get their questions now and then we can jump into it if there's any just general yeah. questions okay. that we didn't answer. Can we just see the HTML? Yeah, yeah. Uh, you want to zoom, zoom that in? Oh, yeah. Um, so, if, if you say, you know what, I came to this class and I thought I was going to be writing code for an hour and you feel like that's not the right thing, you feel free to get up, watch another session. We want you to go to the session you most like to go to. Um, but this is your session. All the other ones, someone's just giving a fixed speech. Here you get to control what the content is. So I think this is the best session, right? Yeah? Yeah. Yeah? yeah. Okay. Um, so, yeah, general I, questions? I, yeah, I mean, does anyone have any just... It can be any sort of question from a, a novice question. You know, there's no stupid question, as they say. A, a novice question, you're not sure about something. How does this compare to something else? I mean, anything that's on your mind. This is a safe, open forum to, to talk about that. Um, and, and, and if not, that's okay. You can also find us individually afterwards. Um, but, I mean, any, any just, you know, you, I, I see many familiar faces that have seen many of our talks. I, I actually be curious. Uh, if those were helpful, uh, what things we didn't cover? Uh, did we not? Did we miss anything? Um, in, any particular topics? If not, you know, we can go into this. Okay. All right. Well, we covered everything. We'll so pair program. I'll stand from back here and okay. uh, be the backseat driver and sure kind of say, "Do this, do right. this, yeah. right? All right, yeah. all right. It sounds good." Um, so if you're programming in, in on App Engine, you can use Java or you can use Python or you can even use an experimental language called uh, Go. Uh, so one way to get started is go to the App Engine um, main website here, which is code.google.com slash App Engine. And there you can, there's a download button. There's also a documentation button, which is where you get all the documentation. Um, so this is where we would download the Python SDK, the Java SDK, or the Go SDK. And, and, and it's worth noting the, the multiple platform support. So if, oh, you, yes. if you use uh, Windows or you're building on Linux, it works on all three. Yeah. So you can run offline on all three. Now, um, many people, many developers who are already building on App Engine, maybe they've been building one or two years in App Engine, don't know some of the most valuable resources. Um, and those are uh, under the docs. You know, we, we have, I think we have fairly good docs. They describe how to do things. You can drill down, you can read for many hours. But way down at the, at the bottom here, we have this section called articles. And there we've actually listed some things by, by feature. So for example, if you're trying to learn the, the App Engine data store, uh, we have here just the data store articles. So these are articles that, they're kind of like documentation, but they talk about a specific scenario. Um, so for example, if, um, here, life of a data store write. So this one tells you in a great amount of detail, um, you see, I think there's a pretty graphic now. I wanna show you an article with a pretty picture. Um, because those are more, more fun. 
transaction isolation, this one, this is what I was thinking of. So this talks about kind of the internal details of how an entity is put in the data store, the different points in time, how commits happen. Uh, it's really a good way to kind of master um, the, the information that you, you see in the documentation. So lots and lots of good articles here, but the best resources aren't even on this page, which is something that we're fixing pretty soon. But what you should do is um, search for Google I.O., which is our big conference, is kind of the, the it's GDD, but we run it uh, in the Bay Area, uh, in San Francisco, we have it every year, and we have about 5,000 dev 5, developers, and they all come at once, and we have a lot of talks and things like that. So uh, we've been running them for, for several years now. Um, so it's here, 2011, lots of, lots of sessions. And um, let's look at some of those. And there's, of course, App Engine specific session. So here, session on backends. And you know, Justin and Greg are two of the engineers that actually wrote the backends feature. So these engineers completely, they, they understand it. They, they tell you all the, the insides and out. We have here a kind of a forward look at full text search. Um, here, Michael Handler, Alan Green, these are two of our site reliability engineers. So these are people keeping the service up and running. They're fighting the, the fires and kind of managing the system. So they give you kind of a behind the scenes uh, look at what's going on. Um, Brett Slatkin has a talk here about the pipeline API. And Brett has a lot of cool talks. Um, I've been able to, to give some of his sessions. Even back in 2008, when the site wasn't as pretty, we still had, um, let's see, uh, let me find it here. It was called Under the Covers of the App Engine Data Store. This is a great talk. Um, what is this one right here? So uh, Ryan Barrett's one of the, the engineers that worked on the kind of early versions of the data store. And uh, he just goes through and, and talks about some of the, the basic stuff about Bigtable and how that fits into the App Engine picture. Uh, talks about transactions and row locking and, and very low level stuff. But this is an, an hour long video that is an excellent kind of what we call 101 or a starter class that explains the data store and how to use it, and he has you know ancestor queries here. I mean, all of this this really great stuff. And there's many many talks like this. And these are, um, like I said, some of the the very best resources out there. Um, and, and you can see the talk. You get the commentary. Um, you know, it's for me. It's always easier to learn by watching. Uh, and so, I mean, you can play these videos, and they're fantastic. Uh, so let's see, maybe one of these will play here. Play a second here. Oh, you got to plug in your audio? Should be in. It might be turned on. Yeah. Um, single row transactions. So you want to read, B, operate on it, write Get it back. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so I'm not, I'm not going to play that for an hour, but clearly you can sit at home and, and watch that for an hour. Um, that would be a little bit unfair to you. Uh, so th that's where some of the best resources are. So imagine you're, you're trying to get started on... But, but, but before you even go there, Fred... I want to get go, started. Go, go back to codegoogle.com. Oh, okay. There's one other resource that I don't think you mentioned that I find useful. Okay. Are the samples, sample apps. Oh, yeah, yeah. So maybe okay. just point out where that is. And I actually have one running. Uh, if you give me the browser in a second, I'll, I'll show you one of my favorite samples. Okay, go for uh, it. Okay. I'll hold the mic. Okay, so uh, one, of the, one of the samples we have is a Mandelbrot, a Ma a Mandelbrot generator. Um, and so uh, I, I downloaded it from the sample site, and then I deployed it, and I always sort of have it running. So I think it's mandelbrot.ien-sandbox.appspot.com. Uh, Hopefully it's still running. Um, and this is Mandelbrot in Java, uh, all in the cloud with caching and all kinds of really cool things. So. Uh, this, it's tiled and uh, it breaks up the images into a bunch of separate uh, web requests. And so what you can do here is, uh, this is really nice, we'll, we'll just double click here and you'll see it's pretty seamless to zoom in. And it's generating this stuff on the fly so you'll see how fast it's uh, rendering in. And we can go pretty deep uh, and, and it's pretty fast. 
And w one of the nice things about uh, that it's rendering this, uh, it's then caching the tiles uh, in memcache so that as further visitors come in, they actually don't even have to wait as long as I just waited. Uh, but uh, this is a really, really, you know, you can go really deep and it's, pr it's pretty fast. So you can download this code sample and, you know, you can play with it. If you don't like Mandelbrot, you want to try a different uh, fractal. Uh, a lot of this stuff is, is in there for you to play with. Uh, no, this is, uh, I'm, I'm not, there's some sort of a JavaScript library that this is using to uh, kind of blend, blend it while it's fetching tiles in the background. It probably, th this sample is, uh, I, I think, probably a year or two old. Um, so, yeah, you can fill, download it. I mean, improve it. It's open source. You can uh, uh, make it better. But it, it is kind of an interesting sample. We have all, all kinds of different samples. But I love this one. I mean, you can just keep going. And uh, it, it just it works. So uh, and you can actually uh, kind of full screen it. And um, eventually it stops. Either get, you get to a limit that the precision doesn't work anymore. But uh, uh, take take a look at this sample. Uh, Very cool. All right. So there's somewhere there's a microphone in the room, and someone's holding it and rubbing it. And Is that there. me? No, no, no. There's I think there's another microphone. It's okay. quiet now. All right. The demo gods. So now I really want to get started. Okay. Now right. you can get started. Sorry, I okay. digress. Okay. But, uh, I like the Mandelbrot. I like to show it off. There, there's that same demo. Uh, implemented in Go as well as in Python, but there are different implementations. So if you don't like that particular If you don't language, like Java, there, you have two more options. Yeah, there's a, yeah, exactly. Okay. So we would go to the download link, and we can either download a standalone SDK, um, and then we worry about our own Java environment or Python environment. The other thing we can do is, if you're an Eclipse developer, you know, if you've, um, if you've gone to eclipse.org, you, know, you can download Eclipse, which is a pretty popular open source uh, Java development tool. And um, you want to download, most people end up downloading this one, but I think you actually want this one, the one for Java EE developers, Enterprise Edition developers. That's because this one includes syntax highlighting for, for HTML and other Java files, which is pretty useful. So you actually want this uh, Eclipse IDE for Java Enterprise Edition developers. Uh, so you, you get that. And then uh, we have a Google plugin for Eclipse. So, you know, we had code.google.com slash app engine. We have a code.google.com slash Eclipse. And this is a special plugin. Um, so, the Google plugin for Eclipse. And what it does is it's uh, some extra functionality. So, let me bring up Eclipse. Uh, if you're f familiar with, uh, with this tool. You'll see that there's an extra icon here, the Google icon. And beneath it, there's a whole bunch of functionality. Uh, so there's integration with uh, Google Web Toolkit, with uh, App Engine, with uh, Speed Tracer. Uh, what else is in there, Ian? Uh, the Google uh, APIs that are available via the, uh, oh, yeah, the yeah. console that will do all the bindings for auth and whatnot. So add Google APIs, you can click that and you can see a bunch of uh, APIs that you can uh, pl plug into your app. But uh, it's, I don't think you're connected right now. Yeah, no internet. Okay. We're wireless. So we'll be running on, on the SDK. So earlier I, I created this the sample app. And I can just recreate it from, from scratch. So we just, to get started, we just say new web application. Now what I've done here, maybe I should say that first, is I downloaded and installed Eclipse. Then I went to code.google.com slash Eclipse. And I said, well, I want to get started quickly. Now I say install the plugin, and that's right here. And basically, you just give Eclipse this URL, and you say install that. And it installs the Google plugin for Eclipse, and it installs the SDK automatically. So you don't actually have to download the SDK separately. It all comes there. So it's kind of a two or three step process. Step one is install Java. Step two, Eclipse. Step three, the Google plugin for Eclipse. And at that point, the SDK is pulled in automatically, and you're ready to go. So imagine you've done that, one, two, three. Now you open up Eclipse, and you have this new icon here that came in there. And you say, okay, new web application project. And by default, uh, it's a Google Web Toolkit and App Engine project. We'll just turn that off. We, we give it a name. And we say here, generate some project sample code. So that gives us a default servlet 
and just something to, to play with and change. Now we have this default project, and within there, a single servlet that just says, hello world. Not, not very interesting, but it's something we can expand upon. And now let's say that um, we actually want to uh, use the data store. We want to persist some data, and we want the user to be able to, um, uh, maybe let's create a, a guest book. That's kind of the typical example. Someone can write a comment and say, I was here. Um, so, it's a, so it's a wall that we can paint on. So let's uh, change the response type to text HTML. Let's actually serve some HTML. And we're going to do something really simple here. So we create a form. Uh, default action will probably work. Input, uh, I think it's name equals, uh, let's see, who? And I think that's all I need. Let's, let's try it out. Let's run this project. So now I can just go to localhost, 8888. And my project's running. Let's see, I think I got the old one. I never stopped the old one, that's my problem. There we go. So we got our little text box. And um, so that's kind of interesting. There's no submit, bu submit button, so we need a, a little bit more work here. Um, so Eclipse is nice, like if I just hit enter here, it creates two new lines, right? So I can just go like this. And I need a input type is submit. Um, okay. And then we, we kind of want to maybe a, a request handler. Um, so we're going to split this up a little bit. I'm going to make it ugly, and then I'll make it pretty again. There we go. So now, uh, let's say uh, in the request, get 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 parameter because we want to read the parameter that the user's just passed in, uh, like who. And this is where at, uh, an IDE, an integrated development environment like Eclipse, really helps. Um, I just do a quick fix. This is command one. And one of the options is assign to new local variable. I just hit enter. And it creates a parameter for me. It's already highlighted, so I can change it and call it who. Done. And now I want to, to print that out. Response, get, writer, print line, who is. Some formatting there. I'm going to stop my server. See, if I was writing Python, I wouldn't need a semicolon, so that that would have been okay. Okay, so who is nothing? So if I say Fred submit, ah, worked. So I passed a parameter to the server, put it in the URL, and then I, I got it out. Pretty simple application. But now I want to, let's say I want to store that in, into the data store. Um, so the, the kind of the pattern that we use here is um, we use a factory. So we have a data store service factory. And it has a get method, get data store service. And then I do my quick fix again and say assign that to a local variable. And that's a very long name, so I'm just going to call it data store service. Actually, I'm not going to do the async one. I'm going to do the regular one. Okay. You got to change the type there on 23. Okay. See, paired programming. That worked. Okay. So I can do a quick fix and say, just fix it for me. If you become very lazy in Eclipse, uh, you can become very productive. If you um, 
So what you need to do is spend a lot of effort trying to figure out how to save yourself two keystrokes. And then once you learn that, then you can save yourself those two keystrokes over and over and over again. Um, so there's actually this fun class at, at, at Google when you, when you first start. Um, it's kind of an introductory to test-driven development. This is where you write your tests first, and then you write your application code. And the first half of the session, uh, they, they have you just write your code. And people do it the old-fashioned way. They, you would type stuff like data, data store service, you know, DS1 equals, and you just type everything out, and it's, it takes a long, long time. And then the second half of the class, the instructor comes back, and he shows you how to write the same code in like 10% of the time. And all he does is uh, write partial code, and then does quick fix, quick fix, and you know, Eclipse is writing all the code for him. So I'll try to instill some of that on you. So let's see, data store. Actually, we, let's create a new uh, entity. Let's see. An entity is kind of a, like a row in the database. And we see, so we can pass in the kind. What kind of entity is it? Um, so it's a guest book entry. So we'll call it a visitor. a visitor. Yeah. Vis all right. We agree here. So now I'm going to do this quick fix key to solve the imports. Yes, I want that import. Quick fix to assign to a local variable. It's magic, it's magic. I can't do this. So visitor set uh, index property. Um, yeah, who? We pass in who. And then I'm just calling go data store dot put. And see, Eclipse fills in. The, that's all I want. Okay. Now before I run this, actually I'll run it. But um, before I test it. I'm going to show you something else that you get in the local SDK. Uh, so here's this form. Um, but there's a special URL with a funny name, underscore AH admin. This gives you a local admin console where you can interact with some of the internals of, of the App Engine app that's being simulated here. Um, so we have this uh, data store viewer. And we can actually look at entities in the, in the data store. Uh, and actually, there are some, some visitors here. Uh, okay. Are you sure you restarted that, Fred? Well, yeah, where are these cash? from? These have IDs, names. I must have used the same example before. I, I think you need to restart your Eclipse. So let me stop this. Kill it. Oh, you need to clear out your data store. Uh, I still have junk in there. Well, that's easy. Yeah, that's easy. There's a flag. Or well, I, I have an admin console for that. Yep. Delete. See. There we go. Now it's truly empty. Okay. So, localhost 888. And so Fred is a visitor here. And let's go back, refresh this page. Hmm. Hmm. This is interesting. It's very interesting. <coughs> Am I creating a lot of them? Interesting. Where's my who property? Maybe I'll click on one of these and see what's inside it. Yeah. Oh, wow, look at this. OK, I'm going to test myself. <laughs> let, me, let me change that. I want to see what happens. Live debugging. What is going on? So we still only have visitors. OK, so I'm going to refresh okay. this page. Now we have a person, okay, list, we just have the one, no property. Oh yeah, an empty one, yes, of course, yes, yes, no condition, thank you. Aim, you didn't I, catch I, that. I, I did not catch that, this was, uh, <laughs> 
been a long day. I did not catch that. That's my fault. But luckily, we have some redundancy in the audience, so uh, we did catch that. That's All right. right. That makes exact sense. So that, that looks a little bit better, right? So uh, should we test it? Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, let, me, let me clean up my mess here. I created a lot of junk. We almost need a map reduce. All right. Empty. Let's stop this. Restart. And we go to the base form. Should we test? Yeah, so this should not show anything. So I'm refreshing. There we go. Okay, now Fred is going to visit his own website again. Yep, list entities, one there record. Okay, much better. Okay, so now let's see. Maybe it's something about the unindexed property. I think that's a little bug. Visitor name. So I refreshed it a couple of times. Yes. There we go. Okay. So that's the problem. I was using unindexed properties. So Ayn is a visitor. Um, Bob. Brad is a visitor. And I refresh. There I have some, some entries. So now I'm persisting things uh, in the data store. And maybe I'd like to um, like to pull them back, retrieve the results. So maybe if, um, if who is null, then let's let's do a data store. Uh, need to make a query, I believe. Need to move this up one row. Yeah. So I actually have an object to find. I'm going too fast here, okay. Yet. Prepare query. Ah, he's going backwards. That works. Well, we can say new query and we can use a kind. And our kind is person, right? Quick fix and say query object. Then here, data store, prepare query. Quick fix. So prepared query. Maybe I don't want that. Maybe execute. Is there an execute? I can never remember. Count entities as single entity as iterable. That seems reasonable. That's right. Okay. Assign that to something. Iterable. Uh, Results. Okay. Then iterate over an iterable. Hmm. Okay. Works. Let's um, let's print something out. I'm going to steal this line of code right here, paste it in there, and say visitor entity get. Actually, what? We just print out the name, maybe? Get, get property at the bottom. That's Backseat one. code. And we had visitor name, right? Correct. All right. That looks reasonable. So now, if I take the parameter off. Hmm, okay. Got a, I got a null visitor, two null visitors. <laughs> So that's uh, records where the property did not exist. So you see here, visitor name didn't exi actually exist on uh, that first row there. So this is where a, a, a lack of a global schema is fun. So we can change this property name. Let's say we change our mind, and now we want to start uh, storing something else. Um, create date, right? And quick fix, Java util date seems reasonable. All right, so I just changed my code, and I'm now going to write um, two properties on on creation. So you said Bob, right? Sure. Hello, Bob. Okay, Bob's here. 
Uh, there's Bob. And you see uh, the, um, there's a slight delay before you see it. Now here's Bob. And you see Bob has an extra uh, property there that the other guys don't have. So this is where there's not really a global schema. Uh, these other rows don't have that property. Uh, it's not that we changed a global table or anything like that. Every single row can have a different set of properties and it, and, uh, it just works. So now I can uh, display the date. Um, I can say created and I want to, let's see, entity get property create date. Now normally we'd make this code a little prettier, but for we only have an hour, so we can't create anything beautiful. But we can make it work. At least I can't create anything beautiful. I don't know. I mean, can you create beautiful things? No. You saw the code I did in the keynote. It's not uh, beautiful. Well, you only had like 10 minutes. I'm, well, I'm all about utility, so all right. um, I need a designer to help me out. So there, create date. And all these other ones are, are null. Um, so we could do like a null check there. And here's another magic uh, quick fix key here. Extract local variable. Uh, and I can just call this thing uh, create date. And it turned that into a local variable. That's very cool. And now I can say if create date is null, um, I don't know what I want to do. Uh, oh, it's an object, so I can assign it to something else. This is cool. Unknown. It's kind of a hack, but it'll work. So are you thinking about the next feature that we need to implement? Because this guest book is almost done. There. So we're mi mixing and matching properties types. Right. Uh, so, yeah, one... We, we, we could mix we and could. match property types. You could actually write unknown in there if you wanted to, for instance. Oh, that, that would right? be interesting. That, that shows... Uh, Let, let's do that. Yeah. So let's imagine that we've decided to add this create date column, uh, which we do here. So all new entities get a create date, but the old ones don't. We have to somehow migrate our customers. So we have to first deal with the fact that some of them may be null, which we do right here. But now we want to kind of fix them on the fly. Every time this customer logs in, let's, let's just fix it. Um, so here we could just say entity.set property uh, create date. I'm going to do uppercase string, so it's a little bit different than, than this one here. So watch what, what happens. Uh, and then we have to call data store put entity. All right. So let's run that again. So in the main URL, so I'm going to hit enter. And the first time we just see unknown in kind of mixed case, just as before. But supposedly, now the data store is fixed. So let's go over here and see if that's actually the case. So yeah, it's already fixed. So now if I refresh this page over here, now it's all uppercase. So those properties have all been touched just because I, I iterated over them. And that, that's pretty powerful because you have a property that can be of different types. You can mix and match. And that's really flexibility that's hard to get in uh, relational databases. Yeah. In fact, we can make this uh, a list property. Um, so let's visitor name could actually be, be multiple names. We could have a list of, of names. Um, so this is, this is coming together pretty good. Uh, what, what else should we do? Java persistence? Uh, uh, there's, there's some support for uh, some of the, the abstraction frameworks. Um, I'm not sure Hibernate is that well supported. Uh, we certainly have Spring users, JDO, JPA. Um, but There's Objectify. The, the normal path is, uh, if you're on Hibernate, then migrate to JPA, which is very close to Hibernate, and then JPA will run an app engine. 
Uh, so, sorry, all of what I just said is relevant for the data store. If you're using the Cloud SQL, then you can just use the, you know, the normal procedure. If it'll use a JDBC driver standard, it, it should work. Yeah. So, yeah. Hmm. All right. Um, hmm. Maybe we could, we could use some, some memcache, maybe? Or... You could... Um, you could deploy it. We could deploy to... Change your account in Eclipse, but you could deploy it. Oh, yeah, we can do that. Um, here, we just say deploy to App Engine. So now my app's ready. I just have to give it... Yeah. App ID. Oh, that's fine. Okay. I have access to it. Um, yeah, so we're, how, how do we get this into the cloud now? You've built this fabulous app. How hard is it? See if this is the old one or the new one now. Oh, it's the it's the new app. So let's look at the um, the admin console. I locked my account down. Okay, and let's look, there's a data store viewer here. And I, I have a bunch of kind of junk data in my app because I do lots of little experiments here. Um, so there's all sorts of things going on, but there's no person entity. So I think we're, we're safe to test our, run our experiment. Uh, so let's say Fred visit the, the online website. And um, so now, let me refresh this. Let's see. Person. So there's one record. There's Fred with a with, with a visitor name. And there's a crate date. So let's say Ayn, you come to visit our online store as well. There you go. And we can even here go in and edit one of these entries. So I can say, well, I actually came in uh, an hour earlier. And, uh, you know, I want a complete name in there. So now I've edited that entry. And I can see things like uh, the number of instances that are running in my application. So actually, App Engine, uh, I've signed up for this always on feature, so it's three of those, a couple of dynamic instances. Um, I can look at the, the logs. Got a lot of traffic to your site, I noticed. 0. 0.003 QPS. Oh, Where you should have seen that? yesterday, I did 0. 0.004 QPS. Mm -hmm. It was a big day. Um, so here you see some warm up requests, and here's actually, let's see, let's change the, the time zone in our logs, because you know, we're, we're not in California anymore. So are we plus one, is that right? So any of these plus one will do. Um, so there we go, three, 31. <coughs> oh, this is also, oh, I'm yeah, only looking for errors. errors. I gotta do all requests. 1605, I think we're still an hour off. My laptop's an hour off. Is the, probably the one right below it is Ayn. Oh, we're, we're plus, two. oh, okay, we're plus two. Any of these. I like Windhoek. Yeah. <laughs> A nice Dutch name for an, an African city. <laughs> um, so there we can see... Uh, all requests. I think icon. you had any in there somewhere. Oh, I'm on the wrong version. Yeah. Am I? No. Maybe take a second to talk about versions. Oh, yeah. So versions are, are really, really cool. So I, ha I have all these different versions, a crazy number of versions. Uh, and each one is actually different source code. Um, so I've deployed many applications. And they all share the same data store and the same memcache. 
Uh, so a typical way of, of using versions is, you know, you have uh, kind of the current live version. So this one's the default. So anyone who goes to fredsa.appspot.com, they hit this version and they execute that code. Uh, but I might have a new version, version 42, that is my new release. It's not ready for users yet, but I've deployed it and I'm ready to test it. So if I go to 42, dot fredsa.appspot.com, then I get that specific version. I interact with the same data, the same memcache, so I can test out the site before I, I put it live. And so there's actually a, a little version section here. It shows me all the versions. It has the, the URLs, and um, so you... And you can mix languages, I see. Oh, yeah, yeah. Look, Java and Python. There's no Go, though. Against the same data store. Yeah, question. The, oh, this, yep. So th this is the page that lists uh, the new pricing model that we're rolling out. And the, the big thing that's happening in the new pricing model is that we're charging for instance hours. So you get um, 28 free instance hours a day. And the reason we did 28 and not 24 is if you just had kind of one instance running all the time, um, that's sort of enough, but every once in a while, if you have a client that makes a few requests, App Engine might briefly spin up a second instance. And so we, we heard a lot of developers say, I love the 24 free instance hours, but I occasionally just go barely over, and it's kind of pain. We said, okay, let's make it 28, make it easy. Uh, so at App Engine, we've always wanted it to be that if you had a small site, and you're just, you know, you're playing around, experimenting, or, or maybe you don't have a lot of traffic, that you could build a free application. So it would cost absolutely nothing. But maybe you're building a game, and uh, what I hear from a lot of game developers is they, the, you know, if I talk to ones that you know, finally have built a successful game, they say, oh, we built 20 or 30 different games, and, you know, game number seven, I showed it to all my friends, and all five of them loved it, and that was it. You know, no one else ever came. And then one day I built this game, and I didn't think much of it, and it just took off, and everyone played it, and I saw a ton of traffic. Uh, and so what you want there is you want... Those, those 20 games that aren't successful, you want those to be free or really cheap because you've made the time investment and you don't want to pay for hosting. But that one that's successful, you want the scalability and you want to be able to be ready. So wait, um, Fred? Yeah. But that says that, so you get one gig of high reputation data store free every day, in and out. Yes, bandwidth in and out, one gigabyte free. So that means you can store up to one gigabyte of data in your application without charge. So if you store a gig and a half, you're paying for half a gig. If you store 500 meg, you're under the free limit. And that price is just 24 cents per month per gig, right? Correct. Correct. So if you have two gigabytes of data and you do nothing with it, um, at the end, that would cost you 24 cents. Because you get one free, the second one you're paying. Yeah. Um, so there's some, some other features here. The, so the main cost, or the, the primary cost, is instance hours. And um, then in addition to that, we, we charge for operations. So like for the data store, um, you know, 10 cents per 100,000 writes. And, and, you know, there's a, f a few details there. Yes? Could I run my app engine on my own server? Uh, you want to talk about AppScale? Yeah, there is a uh, open source project that is run out of uh, Santa Barbara called AppScale. And uh, it's an academic project that basically is meant to uh, replicate the App Engine runtime on a fully open source stack. And I, I think this came out of education and government uh, research. Uh, they wanted to have a you know, alternative runtime uh, for whatever reason if they wanted to run App Engine apps on their own infrastructure. So they've essentially ported and they have, uh, as far as I can tell, API compatibility. So you can take an App Engine app. Uh, you have to, of course, set up app scale and, you know, you can put, you have to put a database somewhere and you have to get up servers and, and configure it. But uh, you, you can run App Engine apps on, you know, unmodified uh, in app scale and they've ported Python, Java, Go. So it's, it's a, a essentially an open source version, but you have to manage the pieces yourself. Yeah? Okay. So that's, that's app scale, that's pricing. So we're back in the, in the console here. I have all these different versions, 
And let's say after some testing, so this goes to a, this, the right URL. So if I click on this, uh, you see it goes to 42 fredisayappspot.com. Of course, there's no working code there because I'm just playing around. One goes to version one um, and so on. And then uh, I can look at instances. So for version one, you know, I have these five instances here. For version 42, I just have one instance because I just hit that URL a moment ago. And if I look at this one, which I haven't used in a long time, uh, it's zero. So App Engine is not running my application anywhere. But if I, if I launch that URL there, now refresh, now I have an instance running. So it was just spun up dynamically. And if I, I hit it a lot, um, I'd probably get more instances. Get, yeah, a couple more. Uh, let's see. Yeah. So there, I have a bunch of instances running. So they just spin up really quickly, and then if I, I wait a few minutes, they'll just shut back down. Um, so that's versions. Uh, I can have multiple versions in use at once. Uh, so another use case is, this is the main application that all my users are using, but then I decide I want to do some data migration, or maybe I have a reporting tool that needs to kind of dig into the data. I can build a separate app that accesses the same data store, and I can deploy it under a different version. Maybe I call the version uh, admin. See, like this one's called data store admin. I could have a version, uh, so when I, when I click on this URL, uh, you see the URL is data store admin. So it could be admin.myfunapp.appspot.com. And you can protect that app and make sure that only you can log in and no one else. And then you can do administrative tasks. So pretty powerful. Do you want to show maybe on the dashboard, I think it's useful to show the graphs. I don't know if you have data, but um, you know the graphs to show requests. Yeah. Uh, when, yeah. Oh, this thing, yeah. I think these are useful. Um, Let's see, what's, uh, here's instances. So you can see how many instances have been running. Uh, total active instances, that's this line down here. And then build, which is how many I'm paying for. And you can see that sometimes you actually get here, total instances, if I zoom in, you can see total is slightly more than what I build for. So App Engine sometimes spins up too many, and then it just doesn't charge you for them. Um, and you can control that with uh, some settings. So if we go to application settings, yeah. uh, let's see. you just passed it. Oh yeah, right here. So we have idle instances and uh, pending latency that we can adjust. So this is the balance between performance and cost. Do you want the app to be really fast, which is the default? Or do you want it to sometimes wait longer so that we spin up fewer instances and it costs you less money? So if you have a, like a demo site, you, you can maybe uh, switch these. Oh, I guess that's the way the slider works. Ooh. Ooh. DJ. Um, what else can we show quota, here? Quota details, maybe? Uh, yeah, you see all the quotas for the app. Uh, Good way to see how much you're using of your free quota during the day. Yep. So, you know, maybe um, I'm thinking, so memcache is kind of fun. Um, maybe. Uh, you could also turn on app stats. That might be too. Yeah, we can, we can turn on app stats. I don't remember how, but that's okay. I have a search engine. App stats, Java, enable. There you go. That's the blog post. I think I want um, this here. That's and that's I got to do this. This yeah, thing. Just here. that whole block right there. Yeah. So I'm just going to copy this code here. So App Stats is a uh, profiling tool that allows you, if you're not sure how your app is performing. Uh, I, I did show this in the keynote. Uh, it's really easy. You add a filter uh, to your web XML, and then it will capture some additional data for each request and allow you to actually see what's going on in your application behind the scenes to uh, debug uh, code or get some insight into the performance 
of your application. So it's re really easy to get a sense for uh, the type of work you're doing and how you might be able to uh, optimize. And there's a great talk uh, online you can search by, uh, Guido, how do you say Guido? Guido. Guido von Rossum, who uh, I think worked on the AppStats project. Yep. Guido von Rossum. I can say that because I'm Dutch. Okay. But, uh, I can't, I don't speak Czech. Do you speak any Czech? I speak no Czech. Okay. Unfortunately. Yeah. I would love to learn someday. Uh, so is th this is all I need, right? This yep, is that's it. You can there. save it and deploy it. Uh, and then the URL pattern there. And what's the, the endpoint? Oh, yeah, you need to. There's one other block of code you're missing at the bottom. Right, right there, that, that uh, block right there. Uh, so this uh, adds the servlet for you to actually view the statistics data. OK, so this first block that I did only captures the it data. It captures the data. It puts it in memcache. And then the, uh, the, the, serv the viewer, the AppStat viewer, will read from memcache and display the data so you can actually see what's going on. There we go. That's right. So because this is the development server, uh, we don't really have any security. We just, you can pretend to be an administrator, pretend to be a regular user. And the way you do that is you just, uh, if I click login, then I pretend to be logged in as whatever email address I specify. If I click the checkbox, then I'm a developer or an administrator. So I'm going to check in. And there's AppStats running locally on this machine, so I can look at the AppStats request, but you I need can to make, make a new request, uh, and we can take a look at it. So we do this. Let's go to the servlet, um, and let's say uh, George joined. So I made that one request. I'm going to refresh this page, and we see actually a bunch of things happen. So the fav icon was requested a few times. Uh, this AppStats JavaScript, but the actual URL we care about is uh, this one right here. So let's, let's expand that. And we see that the only thing that happened in there is we did a, a data store put. And here's the stack trace that happened right at the time we, we made that call. Um, so we see, if I search for my package name there, my servlet line 32 call the method uh, dot uh, do get. So let's see servlet line 32. This one here. That's where you're writing it out, yeah. Yep. So I can see what's going on. I can see how many milliseconds it took, although this is local, so that's not really what I care about. So I want to run this in, in production. Um, so let's go to our production app. Let's um, go to George, insert George, and then same URL, app yep. stats. And you're able to view that because you're already logged in. Yep. And where's my George? There's my George. And now you can see uh, kind of how long this took. And I can see the, the same stack trace there. But I can tell what's, what's going on. Without looking at any code, I know that I call data store to put. And if I had a very complex piece of code and maybe I'm using a third-party library and I have no idea what it's doing, I can just turn on AppStats and I can see exactly, okay, it's making two data store queries, one put, then a memcache write, et cetera. And this is a good way to optimize your application after you have it running. You can go back and look and see if there's opportunity to batch uh, puts uh, or gets or do things in parallel. So a fun story. Uh, Hido, who is uh, the um, inventor of the, the Python language. It's kind of his, uh, his little baby creation. Uh, so there's, there's Hido. He works on the App Engine team. Uh, and he, uh, he's the author of a, a couple of tools. Uh, there's one, a code review tool called uh, Riedfeld, after a Dutch, Dutch painter. So because I'm Dutch, I must show you a search for Riedfeld. Um, see all these, you'll recognize some of the, the, the style here, uh, all those bright colors. So there is the, the quintessential Rietveld, right? Um, so this code review tool lets you upload uh, patches and then um, review them with, with other people that work on the same open source project and you do code reviews with each other. 
uh, app spot. No, that's not. It. Yeah, app spot dot com. So here you see there's some um, patches that people have done. I don't know who these are, but let's let's look at one of these and see what's in here. So someone is submitting a patch and they've they've created all these these files. Let's look at something else. So this is a smaller one. I can view side by side diffs and I can see oh someone made this change right here. You know they added these flags and then I can um, you know I can if I'm signed in I can comment on them. So I can just collaborate and pretending that I I worked on this project I could say. Um, I think you need, and I could just you know write my comment there, and it goes back and forth. And so this code review tool manages all of this. So uh, Hido wrote this. He wrote it in Python on App Engine. So he's on the App Engine team. He knows the low-level stuff. He knows all the trade-offs. Uh, he knows how to do the right things. He knows the Python language. So you would think he's the ideal engineer to build on this stack and just get everything right the first time. Uh, so he was kind of curious, and he built AppStats. That's, that's his project, um, where he's one of the, the key engineers on it. And of course, what would you do when you built an analysis tool like this? You pointed at one of the projects you've created to, to see how efficient it is. And he pointed at it, and he said, oh my gosh, I didn't realize I was doing this and doing that. And he had a whole bunch of improvements right away uh, within kind of a day of launching the tool. And he updated the code review app to, to be faster. Um, I kind of like that story because it, it, it shows how valuable it is to, to have real data. Because um, you can kind of you know, hit the app and you hit refresh and you go, oh, it feels fast or it feels slow. But you have no idea if you're making you know, 50 calls to memcache, each of them two milliseconds, or two calls to memcache, or how many calls should you be making. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so let's see. Can we do something fun? We, we have like five more minutes, right? Well, we might want to see if there's any questions or um, if we have, a, if not, I mean, we can do something fun. Are there any questions? Oh, here's a couple of questions. Yeah. Uh, back to the versions, uh, is there any way to make the, a version private or public? Mm -hmm. I mean, like a version would be accessible only if you are... Sorry. Um, yes, you can make a version um, uh, effectively private by uh, locking it down. So uh, when I pasted that second block of code in here, uh, the one that uh, Ian was talking about. Yeah, the security uh, constraint. Yep. Right here. And the role name is admin. That means you have to be a developer on the application. So what that means is that um, in, the, in the admin console, Right here, if we go down to permissions, there's a list of developers. And you see it's me, myself, and I. Um, Very narcissistic, <laughs> yes. You love yourself, Fred. <laughs> yeah, I, I definitely love myself. Um, so in this case, because I'm listed there, I'm considered an, an admin in, in the web.xml. And so only me, myself, and I can log in and view the app stats. Um, so you do something just like this. Um, you want to kind of create an abstraction in your code. So what I did here was kind of a little bit hacky, right? Because every time I use the, I, I just do a raw um, get property and then uh, other places set property. And there's really no one place where all of this is controlled. What I actually want to do is I want to take this line of code and kind of extract it into a method. Yeah. Um, Set, create, date. It creates a method, right? And actually, you want to turn this into um, I thought you could turn it into a parameter pretty easily. In any case. Um, yeah, I mean, there are a couple of, uh, like Fred, Fred's showing you one way to handle it. I've seen another strategy, which is um, you can version your entities. So you can say this is version one, version two, version three. And if you logically know that, uh, oh, this is version two, you can upgrade it within your software to version three, or you could treat it as version two. Oh. So there's a different strategies to handle that. Um, uh, 
So yeah, there, there, there's just different ways. You have to kind of think a little bit about it, but uh, there's lots of developers have that, but there's different strategies to handle it. Yeah, so you, you could do something um, like this code right here that's kind of fixing up the entity. If I extract that into a method, maybe fix entity. So now I have this, this separate little method does all the kind of work, exactly. and I can just, um, you know, I just have inserted it uh, in line right, right here. So you can do that, that sort of thing. Um, the, the typical approach is um, kind of this, it's this three-step dance where you first modify your application so that it um, understands both the old schema and the new schema. Uh, and then you, um, you, you tell it to, anytime it writes the entity, you always write it in the new schema, but you can still accept entities in the old schema. And once that version is deployed, then you can run a map reduce over all the data. You essentially scan all the data and you just write, 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 write. So then everything's migrated. Once that happens, then the third step is to change the application and remove the support for the old f format. And so you can do this while the application's running. And it doesn't matter if it takes five minutes to migrate your data or it takes five weeks, because your application's live, it's running, it's working. There's no table to lock. There's no you know, lock table, alter table, drop column, add column, modify type. You can just do it on the fly. Uh, and you, sometimes you don't even have to migrate. Uh, if it's a new property, um, just do kind of what we did. If, if property is null, assume a certain value, and then just proceed. And maybe that's fine. Maybe only 10% of your users have this special flag. As long as your application can handle that, then you don't need to put a null value on every single entity because it's just wasting space. Okay, uh, about time? I think we're out of time. Out of time. We'll be around though afterwards. Yep. Come and then, oh, I should bring up the, yeah, the bring URL. Up the fun thing. Oh yeah, the URL, yeah. So this is kind of the self-paced thing that if we had a better setup and we had like four hours and you know, but this is a great code lab to go through. What I really suggest though is find a programming buddy. Uh, you can learn a lot going through this. You learn much, much more going through with someone else. Uh, what the other person does is they force you to kind of read along. You can't skip, right? Because the other person doesn't want to skip the same things you want to skip. So you both are kind of forced to do the whole content. Uh, and together you kind of balance out. So um, pair learning. Also very valuable pair programming. Yeah. Awesome. All right. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you, guys. We'll be around afterwards. <laughs> <laughs>